Now we are going to move to a fireside chat where we're going to hear more still on West Africa. And uh, to lead this conversation, we're going to have an interviewer, Monsieur Mohammed. He is the head of West Africa Upstream Content, Sub-Saharan Africa Oil and Gas at Wood Mackenzie. So basically, this conversation is going to touch on the competitiveness in today's energy world, ENP companies in Africa, and how they must embrace new business models and navigate complex regulatory operational and technical realities. As Africa's upstream landscape evolves, we bring you two of the continent's most active ENP players and two of sub-Saharan Africa's largest oil producing countries to talk about their approach to developing Africa's natural resources. Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur Mohammed. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon all. Thank you for joining us on this fireside chat with two of Africa's leading independent um, EMP companies. Um, you've heard the brief. This is talking about how African EMPs can be well positioned to, um, to develop and evolve in today's environment. Now, building capabilities and accessing finance are important considerations for developing sustainable portfolios to deliver value to both investors and host governments. And with me, I have uh, two influential players um, that operate in Nigeria and Angola mainly, and we'll be discussing this topic. Adriano Mongini is the first CEO of Azul Energy and he joined ENI in 1988 and counts more than 20 years of experience within managerial roles in ENI at the headquarters in Milan and in different affiliates globally. He was appointed executive vice president of different regional upstream organizations and deputy chief operating officer of the upstream at ENI. And he's moved to Angola in 2022 to lead Azul. And Azul Energy was created when BP and ENI combined their Angolan assets and created an incorporated joint venture owned 50-50 by the two companies. Now, Azul owns a uniquely diverse portfolio involving upstream oil development, gas exploration, LNG plants, and Sol a solar joint venture with Sonongo, the national oil company. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And Dr. Alex Irone is the executive director on the board of Owando PLC and the chief operating officer of Owando Energy Resources, a leading exploration and production company in the ups and the upstream subsidiary of Owando PLC. He's also the president and CEO of Owando Clean Energy and has been instrumental in spearheading the strategy to look beyond today's energy requirements by investing in climate-friendly energy projects alongside the traditional upstream portfolio of Owando. And Owando Energy Resources is a Nigerian indigenous company that holds 14 licenses across the onshore swamp and deep water. And also two exploration licenses in Satome and Principe, which makes Owando uh, one of the handful of indigenous players that operate cross borders in sub Saharan Africa. So thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Now let's start off by discussing your business priorities and how your companies are evolving under the current um, energy landscape. Alex, tell us a little bit about how Owando has evolved, and this is a great opportunity to congratulate you on the recent deal announcement where Owando is acquiring ENI's joint venture in Nigeria. Um, what can you share about the deal, and what are some of the learnings that some of the independents can, can take from that? Thank you very much, Monsieur. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I did thank the organizers in my earlier panel, but um, I would like to thank them again uh, for the opportunity to have this discourse together. Uh, I 
also made a comment that uh, we need to look to moving the clean energy conversation to the main stage, because I think we're all part of that conversation. Um, Oando started off as a, you know, a downstream company, uh, you know, almost about 50 years ago. And uh, the founders of the company steadily built that company uh, into what I would say was Nigeria's, at the time, a largest distributor of petroleum products within the country, over 500 filling stations um, in country. Uh, in fact, I see one of our operating heads sitting in the crowd. Uh, he works for somebody else now. We're not upset about that, but uh, <laughs> we, um, and um, we've slowly evolved that into a, a midstream company. Uh, uh, we, we we pride ourselves on the fact that we were the first indigenous company to build gas infrastructure to take gas to industry uh, across Nigeria, especially in Lagos, which is a commercial hub of the country. Uh, we were able at at the height of the company before we divested. Uh, we, we effectively delivered over uh, 170 million scoff of gas to industry uh, on a daily basis. Now, this was huge for the country at the time because hither to that, these industries were using diesel to power their uh, factories or, or economic interests, uh, you know, and uh, bringing gas to them was something that impacted the PL directly uh, and increased value for everybody. But more importantly, we showed that these dreams could be realized, these things could be done. Um, I often joke about the fact that um, if you, in the space of time we built the gas and power company, we built more public pipeline infrastructure than any of the other companies, whether it was a national oil company or local companies. Uh, it was something we set our, our minds on. Uh, we've taken that same spirit into the upstream where we first went to upstream services and then into upstream ownership of assets. And we've built that company over the last two decades. Today, we are um, uh, 16 assets in the portfolio. We have uh, five producing assets um, and we currently produce uh, just under uh, 40,000 barrels of production on a daily basis. A significant proportion of that is gas uh, and we are certainly uh, inspired by the role gas has come to play through the transition. I think Mansour mentioned a recent acquisition. Um, uh, well, we, uh, putting it plainly, we, we have sought to expand our uh, ownership within our current joint venture with ENI and the Nigerian government uh, by uh, acquiring uh, the ENI 20% stake. Um, we have signed the SPA. We're yet to conclude the transaction, but certainly uh, we are excited about the possibilities. Uh, this singular transaction effectively doubles our portfolio of um, energy assets uh, and production. Uh, takes us potentially to a, a 1 billion plus um, reserve, uh, 2P reserve position. So these are exciting times for us. Um, but I think uh, as part of that journey, uh, we have also identified and understand the transition responsibility we all have. And over the last two years, we've made significant headway in that direction as well by creating Wando Clean Energy. Um, and I think uh, Mansour gave a, a slight introduction of that. Uh, the part he missed out was bankable. So we, we, we create bankable clean energy projects to sustain energy provision for the continent. And in truth, it's been uh, certainly a journey that was, we're super proud of. We have great partners. Uh, all the way from, uh, you know, the state governments who are looking at transitioning in a very effective way uh, to uh, OEM, support, OEM providers, some of the financial institutions, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that have come to support us through that journey. So um, I'll stop there uh, and save some time for the Super, thank <laughs> other you. discussions. Thank you. And Adriano, Azul has a very diverse portfolio, and um, I'd like you to talk about some of the key considerations you have to take on board when making, um, when prioritizing your investment decisions and which projects to move forward um, with. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, one of the reasons of Azul Energy was uh, to focus on Angola and uh, 
being able, because uh, you know, when there is an opportunity project in a big corporation like BP or ENI, their, each project is competing with other projects in the portfolio, the capex limitation. And uh, one uh, of the reasons of Azul Energy is to be able to chase uh, every opportunity. That, of course, uh, we, have, we have still the, the commitment to, to give uh, dividends to our shareholder, mm -hmm. but uh, we are pretty strong financially right now. And uh, we, uh, we are lucky enough that we don't have to prioritize. We can chase uh, all the opportunities. Um, we do choice in terms of uh, exploration where we focus more. And uh, definitely uh, we are focusing on uh, uh, in the near, uh, near field exploration in mm -hmm. order to, to, uh, to optimize the value of the current uh, blocks but uh, on the high risk, high reward uh, as well, on the Namib Basin and uh, the ultra deep water that uh, we believe can be the future of, uh, of the country. So right now we are pretty lucky. We are just to, to find a good, uh, good project. This is what uh, is our, our target. Okay, perfect, that's useful. Um, and it is important for independents to demonstrate capability and strong corporate governance uh, in order to build confidence with stakeholders, be that partners, governments, or financiers. Um, and Alex, maybe you can take this and talk about what are the fit for purpose business models that independents can adopt to, to really thrive in the current environment. Certainly, I, th I think when you look at independence, one of the biggest challenges that they face is living up to the reputation of Big Brother. Uh, in Africa, or at least in Nigeria, when we speak about Big Brother, we talk about the people that have ventured into the space before us, uh, largely the IOCs. Um, to run oil and gas operations uh, in today's world, uh, safety is first, sustainability is second, uh, and unfortunately, profitability comes a distant third. Uh, but the reality is you can't achieve the third if you do not have an ecosystem that's able to produce the first two. Right? So um, what does that mean for us independents? Whenever we look at uh, an opportunity in that space, we need to understand in great detail how to prepare ourselves for it. Uh, so when we speak about, I'll give you a very, very quick example, uh, the, the, the transaction we, we, we talked about earlier on. Um, for the last eight years in that position as non-operating partners, we effectively created an operating entity, meaning that for every position in the operator's company, we held that position within our own uh, uh, non-operating company. Why? to not just learn the ropes and understand exactly what was being done, but to build and develop the capacity to be able to one day take over that operatorship, right? Um, obviously the day has come uh, where we can then tr start to flex the learnings that we've had. It's easy to do it on the marginal field, field assets uh, because these are smaller interests. But when you look at large scale um, uh, ownerships, uh, then you, you do have to have a complete engine to, to be able to manage those interests. Um, with regards to sustainability, you do invariably need to have a plan that gets you from where you are to where we want to be. Uh, most institutions will have a sustainability framework. Uh, we are certainly ahead of the curve on that. What we're starting to do now is measure the metrics that take us out of scope one and scope two measurements, or at least um, uh, uh, evaluations. Are we meeting our targets? The targets we've set for ourselves, are we able to surpass them? When you look at that, then you know, producing the assets you have responsibly with low carbon footprints is something that you must focus on. So not only the competence to run the asset, but the, uh, well, the philosophy of how you produce the asset. Uh, uh, you know, Finally, uh, I would say financing. Uh, that's a tricky one for everyone, right? Yeah, uh, we, we don't, uh, I, I don't think there's an IOC out there that isn't a bank of its own, right? Uh, I'm talking being able to lend a subsidiary's money at one or 2%, right? Um, I mean, a bit higher today because of inflation and interest rates, but we don't have that uh, balance sheet. How do you 
achieve the same success or even do better with the fragile balance sheets that most of us have, leaning on capital providers, whether they're local banks, international banks, or funding partners that understand that you're capable of achieving the things you set yourself to do, but most importantly, have the pillars of governance, good governance, um, uh, you know, the, the right capacity, as I spoke about earlier on, and the partnerships to deliver on the promise. So that, for me, if you putting those three together sort of create the model that I think uh, advances the endeavors of uh, independence uh, locally. Now that's uh, really well said, um, that trifecta of financing and um, making sure that you've got strong corporate governance and a vision a plan to uh, from where you are and where you're trying to get to and be prepared to take opportunities when they become available. Um, Adriano, I'm not sure if there's anything you, you want to add to what Alex has said. Um, I think there's an important component around collaboration and partnerships um, in the sector. Um, how important is that uh, for success in, in the sector? Uh, the collaboration is uh, absolutely important. It's uh, fundamental to be successful. And the collaboration means uh, about uh, all the parties involved. The governmental parties, the partner, the shareholder that are playing all, uh, all uh, a very important role. Because uh, we are seeing now in Angola, MPG is very active, as we see just a few minutes ago, very active in promoting uh, the business environment. Some uh, uh, reforms that have been done in the last uh, few years have been very successful. The mutual understanding between the regulator and the company, and to make, and I always say, a simple framework. Because what we like really to have simplicity, to have rules, a few rules clear that can allow us to understand how to progress and the regulator and the, the other components, the partner, to, to partner us in the investing in, uh, for, for growing. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, you touched on financing. Um, so as an independent um, company, what funding models remain available? Because uh, there have been panels about um, financing um, on stage here earlier this morning, and the funding models are changing and the requirements are evolving, one in light of energy transition, but also in, in light of the types of assets and the company profiles. So for independence, what, what's out there available for, for, from a financing point of view? I think, uh when you look at financing for independence, the first place you sort of start off is, you know, what are the reserves on the ground and how can you um, have a check to back the reserves uh, in the ground in, in financial terms or commercial terms? So um, you, you end up with the plain vanilla, you know, reserve-based lending that if you're not, you know, over leveraged, you can certainly capitalize on. Uh, but I think today what we're seeing is a little bit more sophisticated, or I'd say, I don't want to use the word complex because they're not truly complex, they're just uh, a few people willing to take dimensionally expanded risks. Uh, so uh, certainly if you have a producing asset, uh, the elements of that the traders are looking to capitalize on uh, and utilize where they can provide you some upfront capital uh, on advanced barrels sold. But beyond that, we're seeing models where liabilities of, um, I would say, uh, guaranteed repayment sources exist. So even if it's a, if it's a government liability or liability of a partner with uh, a decent reputation, consortiums are willing to take a chance on that and sell that paper forward and, and, and sort of sit in this construct where as production improves and as things improve, you can then, uh, you know, uh, effectively pay down these liabilities. So we've evolved from just the standard what's on the ground, uh, here you go, or check, check for what's on the ground, to things that allow you play around a little bit more with the molecules involved. Um, now, uh, the OEMs, have always supported the industry. Uh, we saw them pull back over the last, I would say, six years on funding activities, but we're seeing them come back, especially for independents, uh, where they're happy to take uh, a reasonable chance on certain 
development programs and provide you some, uh, you know, items that you can then, uh, you know, pay for. But when you put it all in a basket, you, 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 you have a range of financings that you can bolt together to create that solution for you. Commercial banks are still available. The standard financing as we know them is still available, um, but they are a bit more um, cumbersome today. And, and I, I don't want to say ineffective, but just not fit for purpose, uh, just because of the rigid nature of the structures. They and, have um, become more selective. Yes, the they, they, well, they, they have become more selective, uh, for sure. Uh, risk uh, and coupons have gone up. But uh, I think overall, when you look at independent operations, um, sometimes we take over these assets and we don't know exactly when we're going to get into production. So you need someone that can understand and walk that journey with you. Um, and then we get into production and we hit milestones that are perhaps don't achieve what we expect. You need someone that can walk that journey with you as well. Uh, you, you don't just want a straight repayment program. The final component I will say is um, we're seeing more and more instances where you can wrap this up into a bond type structure, right? Where you're able to take uh, a future outlook on a more steady portfolio, um, you know? So you take out some of your more competent assets, you put them into a portfolio, uh, the, the, the production is assured, uh, the reserves are known, and you can string this out into some sort of bond-like structure and people are willing to take risk on that. So That's these are the models we see. It's never one you take, it's usually a cocktail of, of all of them to create uh, the, the value that you need. Sure, thank you. Um, Adriano, from conversations so far at Africa Oil Week, AOW, um, the governments are pushing for more energy access to the population and investors must balance that with profitability. And profitability generally comes from exports. Um, from your experience in light of the energy transition, looking at it from that lens, um, what do EMPs need to survive and thrive? And maybe you can look at it from what are the opportunities that you see in, in, in the continent? The, the oil and gas business alone is, uh, is very is, uh, is limited. So what do we need is to complement the oil and gas and basically oil with gas. Gas, sure. and of course I'm focused in Angola. Gas is just a start of the business of gas because the first, till 2019, the gas had the zero B value. So there was the, all the gas discovered so far were by chance or, or not, not searching for gas. And actually, as I said this morning, Next year, we will drill the first, the very first gas exploration well in Angola in this 2024. Yeah. That's, uh, and, uh, but this is another reform that has been done from uh, the regulator in Angola. And the gas is a business that can play a big role in the transition, can uh, open up other opportunities because uh, the, all the gas value chain can be opened. So, of course, the gas can be monetized through LNG. LNG Angola LNG is working since 10 years almost, mm -hmm. and is, uh, in the last few years very successfully. And uh, the, the target of future development of gas in Angola can partially go through monetizing through export, but it will be a missed opportunity not opening up the local value chain. Of course, uh, our, our, as operator, our duty is to provide the gas. Sure. And uh, what is needed is the commercial link between the products, the selling of the products from the, from the gas uh, value chain and the gas itself. That needs to be found in equilibrium. And that respect, the government subsidies, uh, taxes can play a big role. But this is alone, again, is not, is not enough because we need to extend to the decarbonization because in the, in the transition period, we need to decarbonize our production as much as possible and linking with renewable energies in order to have a perfect mix or perfect, a 
better mix of energy. And is a good balance of energy is absolutely indispensable in nowadays. Okay, now that's useful. Thank you very much. Um, we're nearing the end of the discussion, and <clears throat> I like very briefly if each of you take turns summarizing your vision for um, the ideal independent energy company. Um, what's the outlook for independence in Africa? You've talked about some great opportunities there, particularly on gas and diversifying the energy mix. Um, what does the future energy company in Africa look like? Adriano? There, is, there are so many opportunities. And uh, we have seen uh, all the speech this morning, uh, how many opportunities there are. What uh, is, uh, we need is just uh, to pick up the opportunities. And uh, in Angola, in particular, probably we will not see the big uh, discoveries that have been in the 90s and the early 20s, uh, the very huge discoveries. But uh, we will, there is uh, still a lot of potential. There is a huge potential still to be found. And actually, even some new basin, the Lambie Basin, will be going to be explored in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a, new, a, a new adventure that we hope uh, could be successful. So there are both, uh, uh, both ways, in the traditional, and uh, again, the gas in particular, it can be opening a completely different uh, perspective for the country. Thank you. Alex, same question. Um, it's a very interesting question because I, I, I look at Nigeria and the ingredients you need for that sort of differ from, you know, Angola, for example, or other countries. Um, the, the one thread across all of them, I think, is collaboration. Um, and this collaboration has to start uh, at the top to bottom and left to right. So government policy is important. I see Angola making exactly the same, taking the same steps we did at the start of our industry uh, by uh, you know, every single molecule of gas produced is more efficient to export than for local consumption. Uh, we're suffering that in Nigeria today. We don't have a, the appropriate gas infrastructure. So, for me, it's, it's how do we collaborate and ensure we have the right policies uh, from the top. We have the right leadership in the independent companies to ensure governance is prioritized. On the operating side, safety is prioritized. And how do we have a financial system that understands our needs but is willing to fund Africa's development in a just way uh, so we don't exclude the transition, but most importantly, we prioritize feeding our people and making these companies profitable. I'll stop there. That's a really great place to end the conversation. Um, profitability and access to energy for the continent. Um, really great place. So thank you very much for your insightful responses. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, that's Adriano, uh, CEO of Azul Energy, and Dr. Alex, COO of Owando Energy Resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.